right in front of me here. There you go. How's Elijah today? Are you good? That's great. Hello, hello. Hello, hello. And yes. Confirmation kiddos, come on up. So I'm going to hum a tune. And I wonder if you can uh, guess what it is. I bet you all know, but nobody out there say it, okay? If you think you know it, raise your hand. What is it? Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. It is. You know the words to Jesus loves me? Jesus loves me. This I know for the Bible tells me so. Little ones, that's all of us, to him belong. They are weak. He is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me. This is sign language. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. So I'm, we're going to sing that song a little bit later. But first, I want to give you some new words to that song because we have another song today. Did you hear it when we were reading the Bible lesson, all of us together? Did you hear that song? Yes. Are you sure? It didn't sound like a song to me. It just sounded like words. It was a song that Mary sang. Do you know who Mary was? Mary was who? Jesus' Jesus's mom. Mary was Jesus' mom, and she remembered. She remembered, just like you remembered the song, Jesus Loves Me. She remembered that God loved her. Only her song was a little bit different. And so maybe, I think just maybe, we can maybe take some of Mary's song and sing it to the Jesus Loves Me tune. Do you want to try that? Okay, let's try it. Let me see here. Um, I'm going to find the, the words of Mary's song that have been changed around a little bit so they fit the tune. All right. God loved Mary, this she knew. Can you sing that after me? God loved Mary, this she knew. God had things for her to do. You sing it. God had things for her to do. Okay. Hey, that's that kind of works. Right. God had things for Mary to do. And she remembered. Do your mom and dads ever ask you to do things around the house? And do you ever forget? Nathaniel forgets sometimes. Yeah. Sometimes I forget. Even though I make a list of things to do, sometimes I forget. But what's one way you can remember? Can you remember by maybe singing a song? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, maybe you can sing a song. I've got to sweep the floor tonight. I've got to sweep the floor. All right, whatever your chore is, you make up a little song, and maybe it'll help you remember. All right, so Mary sang a song, and it helped her remember God's promises. Let's do another one. Let's see. Um, how about one we take and make it about Jesus? So ready? Jesus loves both me and you. Can you do that one? Jesus loves both me and you. Yeah, that's a good idea. We can point at ourselves and point at each other, and that helps us remember. All right. He has things for us to do. Good. Has things for us to do. Ah, so now we're getting it. You can take any Bible verse and make it a song. In fact, that's what Martin Luther said. Martin Luther said, a word sung is twice learned. Can you say that with me? A word sung is twice learned. That's right. So if you sing it, it helps you remember it. So we have songs all through our Bible of people remembering God's love and remembering Jesus loves you. Do you know? Do you remember Jesus loves you? Yeah. Yeah, you do. I like Christmas. You love Christmas, don't you? Not just like it. I can tell. We do. Well, let's sing the, the real Jesus loves me and help it and help us remember that. Can you do that with me? Christmas song. Oh, we're gonna sing a Christmas song. You know what? Jesus loves me is a Christmas song. How many of you didn't know that? All right, let's sing together. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong. They are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Bless you. The Bible tells me so. Okay, last week I gave you a picture of a sign. This week, 
giving you a picture of a cross. And for moms and dads and grandpas and grandmas, there's a page on the other side that talks about what we just talked about, so they can remind you this week. And you get to color in the cross. Now, the, pa- the basket with all of the coloring stuff is out in the narthex today, so the- or is right over there. Okay, so you may have to, it's in a different place, if you, if you don't have crayons or pens already. But you can take this back to your seat. You can color it. Do you, you all want to? No, okay, you don't need to color it because we have work in confirmation to do today. <laughs> Thanks for your help this morning. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Do you ever wonder who taught Mary what she remembered? Who taught Mary? In those days, um, women were educated in a different way. I learned the hard way at an early age not to say that uh, because one spouse leaves the house, goes to a different place, does a job, and comes home with a paycheck, and the other one stays at home, that you don't say that one is working and one is not. In fact, they're just different kinds of work. And the same is true of learning. I also learned, say, just because uh, my name may have extra letters behind it, because I may have a piece of paper on the wall that says I've been to an institute of higher education, that I am educated, learned, or whatnot, and others who did not are not. That's not true either. Some folks have grown up learning at the school of hard knocks. Have you heard that before? We learn in different ways, and we remember in different ways. I learned in my PDC, my permaculture design course, that I got a reminder that pain and pleasure are two of the greatest mechanisms for learning. Pain and pleasure are two of the greatest mechanisms for learning. The painful moments in our life, how many of you have forgotten those because you've blacked them out? But oftentimes those are the moments that we learn a lesson. That's why for Eons, We have associated a painful reminder with a child's mistake. Whether that's a smack on the wrist or a rap on the knuckles, sadly, worse. Those painful moments teach us things, and yet also the pleasurable moments teach us. Is that an evolutionary thing that we've realized that fruit tastes good and it brings us pleasure and that makes it good? Perhaps. We learn through those moments of pleasure and pain. But sometimes we learn because we ask a teacher to teach us, whether it's in a classroom or in a sanctuary. We learn because someone transmits to us information. In this case, verbal information. Mary's culture was a verbal transmission culture. The words passed on from generation to generation through song as a way of remembrance. So many songs in the scripture are just there for the sake of remembering the story. So how did Mary learn? Probably orally transmitted, taught to her from word of mouth to ear. As far as we know, Mary was pretty young, surely in her teens, when the angel came to her and announced that she was to be the mother of Jesus. And while she was surprised at the angel's presence and at the angel's greeting, the angels were uh, seven-foot-tall glowing men showing up in your room. That would be surprising, I think. She doesn't seem all that surprised with the angel's message. Well, she does have questions about how that pregnancy would happen. How is this to be? For I am a virgin. She is engaged, but she's not yet married. But the message that the Messiah was coming, the Savior of the world was coming, that does not seem to faze her. The content is not in dispute. Who had told her this? Why was that not a surprise? Who had told her that Messiah would come? 
Was it her mother who hummed that melody while she was in her womb? Was it her mother and father who sang the songs of their fathers? It was not the custom of the times for a rabbi to teach girls, but perhaps maybe she had heard her male cousins shout out the great promises made to their ancestor Abraham. Or was it her fiancé Joseph, who, while sharing plans for their life together, also shared hopes and dreams that they might live when the promised one came? Someone shared that melody with her, and that melody was reinforced when the angel told her that her relative Elizabeth was also expecting. Mary must have known her. She knew she was old, but the angel assured her that with God, nothing is impossible. Elizabeth undoubtedly reinforced her melody. At the core of the faith held so tightly by the Jewish people was the covenant relationship with God and Abraham. The covenant that God had made with Abraham was at the core of their faith. Mary knew about that covenant. And while she might have known there were different kinds of covenants... This one was about an agreement of non-equals. How do you arrange a covenant between partners that aren't equally balanced? The large company on the one hand and the hurt individual on the other. Who stands in the gap between the powerful and the less powerful? Those we like to often chide and make fun of, perhaps, the noble of the legal profession. Oh, yeah, we pick on lawyers until you need a good one. And then it's nice to know those who know the law, those who are familiar with the ins and outs of a system that has been designed to protect us, a system of covenants of sorts. That's all the law is. That metal sign on the side of the road, the one that some of you look at from time to time, teasing you. You know, the one with the numbers on it that says speed limit, not speed suggestion. That one, here I'm being judgmental again. (laughs) All that is is a covenant. It's a covenant between you and me and our community that we have agreed upon that that's the safe speed for that section of road and that's what we're going to stick to. But that's a covenant among equals, yet it's enforced by those that we have set apart as our officers of the law to watch what we do, to remind us when we step out of bounds and protect us, if need be, from those who are powerful and operate outside of the law, who choose to step out of those bounds and hurt others. How do you maintain a covenant between those who are powerful and those who are not when a covenant is imbalanced? God, the creator of the universe, God for whom nothing is impossible. God who brings the dead to life, creates life from the dust. How do you covenant with such a being? We who are the powerless, the face of God. And yet we know our God is a God of love who chooses to covenant with us. Mary knew this. She might have known there were different kinds of covenants, but Mary knew God's commitment in this covenant with Abraham. She knew this God would be loving, caring, forgiving, renewing, and an empowering God. That God would always have a place for Abraham, the promised land. He would always have a people for Abraham, as numerous as the sands on the shore and the Stars in the heavens. He would release blessings through Abraham by which all people would be blessed. Mary's melody of remembrance could recall the many times that God had been faithful to his covenant promise. She would know the experiences of the people of God when the proud had been scattered and the mighty had been brought down. She knew the stories of her people when the hungry had been filled and the rich had been sent away empty. 
now she would become the mother of the one who would be holy, the Son of God. And she has passed that melody of remembrance on to us. We have had good and faithful people hum it and sing it into our lives. We know the melody well, and it makes all the difference in the world to us. Now, with regret, we have to acknowledge that sometimes we have muffled the tune. We've covered it up with other tunes. Perhaps the tunes uh, that we sing are more about money, power, privilege. Now, I, I like a whole variety of styles of music. And recently, Daylene and I were talking about music, and you know, when music is good, it's just good music. It's unfair to pick upon uh, one style of music or another, and yet we kind of do. Sometimes I like to pick on country music. I apologize to you country fans out there, but I do. It's because I know you're good natured people and can take a joke. How's that? You do know what you get when you play a country record backwards, don't you? <laughs> if you don't, ask your neighbor, and he'll perhaps tell you. We have a whole range of melodies floating around in our heads. Practicing for this Christmas play that we've been uh, putting on, this Christmas musical. Christmas musical, kind of put together Christmas musical. I go home with Christmas in the Caribbean stuck in my head. Right. I have to turn on the music, listen to something else to get that tune out of my head because while I need to remember that tune and the words to it, um, a few hours of rehearsing it is enough. Time to hear something else to still the thoughts. What do you do when you get a song stuck in your head? Listen to something else, right? This is the song that... Oh, there you go. Think of a song that you once got stuck in your head, or don't if you don't want to. But now think about a song, not as a tune, a melody, perhaps with words, but as a behavior, maybe a habit, maybe an addiction. Maybe a pattern of our life that we've grown so accustomed to. Maybe a tradition. A tradition that has long since taken the place of a sincere faith. You know what tradition is, right? Tradition, in its best form, is the living faith of the dead. Tradition is a song of remembrance that helps us recall the promises of God, and live out lives of faith. But just as equally, there is traditionalism. The difference what those three little letters, ISM, can make between tradition and traditionalism. While the tradition is a living faith of the dead, traditionalism is the dead faith of the living. When we cling too tightly to the tradition and have forgotten the faith that undergirds it, then it becomes a hollow and empty practice. No doubt the people in Jesus' day were criticized for this, and the people of all times, we need that criticism as well. When we cling too tightly to our traditions and have forgotten the faith that perhaps once undergirded them, it does not mean that faith cannot be recaptured or rekindled, that traditional, traditionalism cannot become tradition again. And too often, I think, in our day, we have tossed aside many good traditions, that are Advent to be one of those blessed and filled with meaning for the sake of traditionalism, the warm fuzzies we get from the structures of the season. But the faith that undergirds it is the song that we are called to sing, the song of remembrance. Remember a time when faith was new and the song was fresh met our ears 
with glad excitement, or perhaps interest, when the word of faith just began to kindle and grow into a flame. Do you remember that time? Can you still hear that song? We are called to remember. Mary's song is a call of remembrance to remind us of our faith. We have not sounded the tune of remembrance often enough. We have denied it to those who might be open to hearing it. We have not hummed it to those in our womb, to our cousins, to those with whom we have a committed relationship. We have our excuses, and as sorry as they may be. The glorious truth is, we have this wonderful covenant relationship with the one born to Mary, the Holy One, the Son of God. He is for us what he was for Mary, for all those before her and all those who follow her. It is that God is the one in Christ who is for us such a loving word, who has a place for us in his heart until he receives us in his promised land. He has for us people who rejoice with us, who grieve with us, who pray for us. And he wishes even more to bless many through us. This word of remembrance is not just a word spoken by a personal Savior to a lonely heart, but it is a word for community, for the people of God, for all who hear it and come together around it to sing it. Mary's song, a melody of remembrance. How wonderful that it is also our song, a melody of remembrance. Who taught Mary? Well, that's not the important question. What is important is that we recognize those who have hummed that melody into our lives, and those to whom we can pass it on. Mary sang, He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and to his offspring forever. We are the children of that promise. Our great, 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 etc., grandfather Abraham. For St. Paul says, for as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. And if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. Amen.